When you're out in the wilderness, you're out in the outdoors, uh, probably the most important thing you need is shelter. And I've got Dan Wolwack of uh, Cold Cracker Bushcraft, and we're gonna be talking about shelter and campsites and all that. What do we need to think about with campsites right off the bat? Well, when you first get into camp in the evening, you wanna start looking around at a few different things. First, we wanna think about our location of exactly where we're gonna set up camp because it's important that we understand wind direction. Mm -hmm. We don't want the wind blowing in our face, especially when we're using a tarp shelter. Right. We also wanna look up and look around and make sure yeah. there's no dead trees that can fall on us and injure us while we're at camp. We also wanna make sure that we're in an area that we have plenty of firewood for colder weather. Mm -hmm. And we also wanna make sure there's a water source close. So if it becomes a more stationary camp, we have a good supply of water that we can bring into camp rather than trekking further out probably other kind of dangers than falling trees. What else kind of comes to mind? So we want to make sure that we're not in an area that can flash flood. If we're close to a river and it was raining, we don't want anything to flood us out. We want to look around the area for any type of poison ivy or poison hemlock that might be in the area so we're not laying in that all night. If it's the summertime, we need to think about snakes and depending on what region we're in, we need to also think about animals and do we have protection from that if something's going to come into our camp. So what about our spot here? So this looks like a pretty good spot. We were looking around here right before we started this video. No widow makers, so nothing that can fall on us. We have water source not too far away. Good supply of firewood all throughout here. So I think that we're in a really good area. So what do we need for our shelter? So this shelter is super simple. It can get packed in your bedroll. All that we have is a tarp and mm -hmm. a few pieces of rope, and that's all we're gonna need. Tent pegs and toggles we can make right off the landscape here. Great, so let's get started. So let's look at our exact materials we got here. So we have an oil skin tarp, okay. and this is a square tarp. How, this is how eight, big is it? Eight foot by eight foot. Okay. So this is a good size for not only one person, but you can put multiple people under this if it's really inclement weather. Right. And then what you're holding, we have some hemp rope. Right. So that'll always work well. I have a little bit of twine because in the back country, you might not always have a lot of rope, so you gotta make do, so we'll use a little right. bit of cordage. And then one thing I didn't bring was tent pegs. So okay. we have to make that off the landscape. So two styles of tent pegs you can make is take a Y branch and just cut it in this fashion. And when you drive mm -hmm. it down, it'll hook it in place. The second is just a straight stick with a seven notch cut, and this'll work just as well. Mm -hmm. And I always like to also have some toggles, which are just straight pieces of straight wood, stick. just to pull some sections of the tarp out. Okay, and how much does that tarp weigh? You know. Um, that tarp weighs about three and a half to four pounds. Oh yeah, so you're not carrying too much. That'll fit right in your pack. Yep, and a good thing with the tarp, it's super versatile, which I'm gonna show you in a second. So not only can you set up a lean-to configuration, but we'll look at a plow point for more adverse weather conditions. The first shelter that we're gonna set up is a lean-to, and this works really well just for all types of weather conditions. We just wanna make sure when we set up that the wind is coming back. We want the shelter to take the brunt of the weather. Right. So in front of the lean-to then, we can set our fire, and we'll have a good open area that if it's adverse right. weather, we can work, anything like that. So the, the way we set this up is we come from waist level. Everybody's mm -hmm. gonna be a little bit different, but around waist level is best. There are a ton of different ways you can work your cordage to actually tie this up, but I'm gonna show you a really easy way today. So waist level, we're gonna just take that thinner piece of cordage and just wrap it around the tree like this, and we're gonna tie a basic shoelace bow Right. right on here. Right, so we can untie it quickly. So we can untie it and we can be on our way with it. Really easy. Now we're gonna come across the front of this and we're gonna grab a second piece of our hemp rope and we have tie outs on here so I'm just gonna run it through one of these tie out points. Okay. And I'm gonna bring that to this tree. Same setup on this tree. I'm just gonna pull that nice and taunt, wrap it around, and tie that shoelace knot again. And we have the beginning of our shelter setup. Next, we need to put the tent pegs in. So John, if you wanna pull your side first to get a good and taunt, okay. nice and tight and back. There you go. Yep. And then I'll tighten my side out real good and taunt. Now, as you see, we are starting to have a shelter, but that middle sag is gonna right. be a little bit of a problem. Yeah, it might so, fill with rain or whatever. Yep, so I'm just gonna take a toggle on my center tie-out point with an extra piece of rope, and I can run that back to a tree that's really close here. Right. And then when I pull that, you can see we got a lot of lift yeah. on the inside. Oh, so it gives us, yeah. gives us way more room, and it's gonna help run that water off of there. Yeah. And this could just get tied off real simply, however you wish to tie this off, and then we have ourselves a nice, easy shelter that's quick to set up and easy to set up. 
That looks great. Now we already had the lean-to set up tied off to one tree, so I took the rope down. Now we can actually just stake out the three corners and lift the center and we have a plow point configuration for okay. more adverse weather. So the first part of a plow point is always the back corner away from the tree. You want to get good tension on that. So I'm going to stake this out first, pulling it good and tight and driving that stake in. Okay. And then both of us can stake out each side just in a diamond or tr configuration. And then simply again, see we have that little bit of sag. I could just bring my rope around a tree that's in the back and begin to lift that up. And that's mm -hmm. gonna give us more height inside to do whatever we need to do while we're in the field. And probably this arrangement of having a tree right here is really important. Is there other any other thing we can do if we don't have a tree just in the right location? If we don't have a tree, we can always put a tripod right in this back section and run it over the tripod. That okay. would help tremendously. So we too. could have a tripod here and it's our temporary tree. It's right? our temporary okay. tree. Perfect. Tell me about fire, how to make it, what they would have had. Well, their prefer preferred method of starting fire would have been flint and steel. That's mm -hmm. the technology they would have used. But before you even get to that, it's very important that you know the triangle of fire. So the triangle of fire is heat, oxygen, and fuel. If you have all three elements, you'll have fire. If you lose any one of them elements, you don't have fire. So it really is broken down that easily. Now fire is much more complicated because there's a lot of factors that go into it, but it always boils back down to that triangle of fire. So even when we used our flint, stri our flint and steel set, it's all about that triangle of fire. Right. So let's look at a flint and steel set here. So flint and steel technology is, it's quite simple actually. It's a hardened piece of metal and a piece of flint. And when you strike this, it's going to create a spark. So when I strike my striker off my piece of flint, we're creating spark. Now what a lot of people don't realize is that how this actually works is we have a hardened piece of steel, but we have a harder rock. So this rock is removing metal from our striker every hit. So when it removes that metal, it's combusting in the air and that's giving us our low temperature spark. So with this alone, we can't have a fire. These sparks aren't just gonna right. just light could, a piece of wood on fire. We could try it and it wouldn't it's burn. It's not gonna do yeah. anything. So we need a medium to create an ember. And that's where either charred material of what's around us or natural mm -hmm. char or some type of charred cloth. And that's what we're gonna start with first is charred cloth. Okay. So let's look at first the technique of actually how we're gonna ignite this char cloth. We wanna think about our piece of flint as a razor blade. Yeah. And that razor blade is removing metal from our striker. So at a 45 degree angle upward, it's gonna be most ideal. And when you hit this with your piece of metal, you wanna think about removing that material. So imagine you're using this razor blade to slice, slice that off. So you don't need a lot of pressure and it's more of a slicing motion than it is a hitting motion. So we're just slicing downward and the majority of those sparks are rolling over the top. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we would take something like our charred cloth and we place that on top of our flint that's at a 45 degree angle. And then what we can do is begin to strike this. Oh, and you caught right there. Give it a little bit of oxygen and we have a lit piece of char cloth. So we have heat, we have, you know, we've got uh, we have, oxygen, but we, we need some fuel really, yep, right? Yep, so yep, we have an ember there and now we need some fuel. So that's where a bird's nest or a, um, tinder bundle come into play. So let's look at actually how we build that okay. and then we'll reignite a piece of this and blow it to flame. Okay. There's a multitude of different ways we can make bird's nests. So starting with just tree bark, we can look at inner bark from tulip poplar, inner bark from basswood, even bark from a cedar tree, mm -hmm. or what I collected here earlier is some birch. Oh, so right. all of that will work really well. And it's always great to team different things up together. So not only the inner bark, but you can take something like some of this dried grass that right. we found down near the pond, and then something like this cattail, which fluffs up really well. It doesn't ignite too well, but it's a very good ember carrier. So it will extend our ember. So adding all of this into a bird's nest is really well. Once we place our ember inside and we add oxygen to that triangle of fire, we now have heat from the ember, fuel from our bird's nest, and we add the oxygen and we should at that point have flame. Right, so let's get, let's make a bird's nest. Okay, one thing that is very important is when you create a bird's nest, you don't wanna make it that it looks like a bird was sitting in it. You want more depth this way, front okay. to back, rather than really big. So you can mm -hmm. see I have that when that, I have some thickness there. So right. when that ember starts to burn in, it has somewhere to burn into. Right. So let me grab a little bit of this cattail okay. and I'll put this in here just as a extender. 
just like that. Now, if you can give me some char cloth. One thing that's always important with char cloth too is you can always make more. We can always make more out in the field. So if you ever think that the material is a little subpar, just grab a little bit more cloth. Okay. And we know it's been a little wet out here, so we can take a little bit extra, right. and then we can always make some after the fact. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually gonna let you hold this okay. while I ignite the char cloth. Same technique that we just looked at a second earlier. We're gonna keep that piece of flint at a 45 degree angle, put our piece of char right on top of it, and get this ignited. Always put your fire making device away. There you go. And now I'm gonna place that right in the middle of that bird's nest and I'm gonna to begin to give it some oxygen. Now, as that burns and grows larger, mm -hmm. I can start to close that in because we want to trap that heat in more and give it more fuel around right. itself. And as soon as we have flame, we never want to blow on open flame and then of course turn it on itself like this yeah. because that's giving it more fuel and we know heat rises. So we would take this and place it into, inside our fire lay. Right. And then once that's inside our fire lay, we wanna think about how are we gonna do this again? So mm -hmm. that's where we're gonna to start to make more charred material. Now to make our charred material, what we wanna do is first get some type of tin. So this is just a plain tin container we're gonna actually place this in the fire once we put our material in it. Now, if the tin doesn't have any type of vent, we need to vent it somehow. Right. If it seems like it has a hinge or anything like that, it normally has enough airflow out of it that it's gonna be fine. Okay. So we just open up our tin and we can place our material into it. Now, material, we have a bunch of different options. Any type of natural cotton material will work just fine. We also collected some punkwood while we were out there. So punkwood is just that spongy wood that's starting to rot, but it's not totally rotted yet. Exactly. We can just place that inside. Cattail works fine. Also, any kind of pithy plant material that's dry will work good. Mm -hmm. We're gonna place this in the fire and allow it to start to cook. You might see some flame and some smoke right. coming out of there. That is just the material we place inside becoming carbon at that point. Mm -hmm. So it's really important we just keep it in there long enough. You can't overcook char, but okay. you can undercook it. 10 minutes will probably be enough for what we have here, and then we'll test it out. Now our char material is off the fire for a good amount of time. We really want that to get to just room temperature in right. a sense, because if we open that up ahead of time, we introduce oxygen in that triangle fire, it will ignite into, a, into an ember. And it'll burn up and... Yeah, so yeah. we don't want that to happen. So we have to let this cool. A good rule of thumb is that if you can handle it and hold it, it's fine. So we open that up and we look, everything has been charred from our yeah. punk wood to our cloth and we are ready then to make our next fire. And so, if it doesn't get all burned up properly? Then you can just put it back in the fire and just char it a little bit more. So it's not rocket science, it's just very simple. So okay. if it looks brown or there's any color left in the material, put it back in and let it cook a little bit more. Okay. Um, so you mentioned earlier, if we lost our flint and steel, if we don't have it, what mm -hmm. are our other options? I've got a flint lock here. So flint lock is flint and steel technology. Right. So we can use, the char cloth right in place of where the powder would be. Of course, you want to make sure that your gun's, gun's not, not loaded, loaded right? but uh, we could just take a, a swatch of this, place it right down there in the pan. Yep, we close it. And then uh, we can just go ahead and set it off and it should ignite Here we the go. char cloth. There you go, it's all ignited and we can just take that right out and put it into our bird's nest. Yep, and that would be it. So, I mean, it's a very simple process and there's multiple ways to do it. Right, and, and we don't have to have an extra piece of equipment. Nope. We can just do it right there. Nope. What do you think about staying warm in this kind of weather? Well, it's definitely very important. And I recently did some research and read that when the long hunters were out, their feet were so arthritic from the cold temperatures and the wet rain with their moccasins that they a lot of times had to sleep with their feet towards the fire just so they can get up and move yeah. around appropriately in the morning. Yeah, it was always it's always difficult um, in this kind of weather to stay healthy enough to continue to do what you need to do. and. Uh, you know, staying warm when sleeping or whatever, or when it's really rainy out. Yep, and I think we can all agree that a good night's sleep is the best thing we can get. So we can yeah. look at now how not only to have our shelter set up, but we can talk about building a good debris bed and how to wrap up appropriately with our blanket. So how do we stay warm? 
Well, there's a couple different things we can do. The first thing is we can use a wool blanket appropriately, but before we even wrap up in our wool blanket, we can build a debris bed. And a debris bed is gonna insulate us from the, the ground and help us with conduction. So right. it's not gonna suck the heat out of us. In this type of environment, we can either use browse, so we can use something like evergreen, we right. can break the branches off, or we can use debris from the ground. Mm -hmm. So where we're at right now, we don't have any access to any evergreen, so what we're gonna use is debris off the ground. It is wet, but that's just all part of it. It's better to have that insulative value on the ground and be okay. a little bit wet than lay directly on the wet ground. So our choices are what, leaves, or if we had really thick moss, or what else? Yep, anything like leaves, moss, you can mix all that stuff in together, or those pine boughs. You really want, once it's compressed, about four inches of compressed material. So we really wow. need to load the a leaves lot. in here to right. get on there and get really cocooned so down. So four inches when it's compressed? Yes. Wow, okay. 12 well, inches is even better, but we'll go with four. We're gonna go out and get a bunch of leaves and see what, see what we can do. So Let's, this is really w what we want to start with. It's very simple. You see, there's not much to it. Yeah. We think there's going to be much more to it, but there's not. So what we want to first do is get any of these larger sticks that we might have picked up, right. get them out of the way, and really just get the hump that's in the center of this out. We want to make it somewhat like a mattress. Once it's like this, it's then just to lay on it and see where we're at with our compression. So I'm really close to right, that, right. that four Seems inches. Seems like it's kind of suspended above it. Yep, and that's what we're looking for ideally. You need to remember that in any type of setting like this, it's not always gonna be about the most comfort, it's just keeping ourselves safe in this type of environment. It's adding right. comfort, but it's also keeping us safe because it's keeping us warmer throughout the night. Now it's time to set our blanket up, but rather than just folding it over us and only having one layer of wool on the right. top and the bottom, we can really maximize the use of this blanket in cold weather like this. So to do so, we wanna unroll this blanket and set it up that it looks like a diamond shape. It doesn't have to be perfect at first, we're just looking for that diamond shape. Mm -hmm. Then once we lay in the blanket, we wanna create as many layers on top and on its bottom as possible. So we take this bottom piece, we fold it underneath our legs so it covered our feet, and then we take one of these ends, fold it across our body. This has given us one layer on the top. Now we already have one layer on the bottom, but we're gonna take this end that we just folded over and put this underneath us also. So now we have two layers underneath. Now we're gonna put a third layer over us on the top, like that, and then guess what? We're gonna fold underneath, and now we have three layers underneath us. And now, we can take off our hat, and we can slide back and just make some very fine adjustments here in order to get comfortable. Now we have maximum coverage with our, with our blanket, keeping us nice and warm. So we're out in the wilderness, uh, maybe we don't have the right kind of coat, but we've got a blanket. How can we wear it? Yeah, so there's several different ways we can wear it. The easiest way is to take your blanket and just basically lay it over your shoulders and use something called a blanket pin. And that pin pins through such as that and just rotates around. And that's gonna just keep this in place like a shawl and give us that extra layer of warmth. Mm -hmm. But if you have a little bit larger blanket than this, there's also another option. And that's what I'm gonna have you do right now. Okay. So we're gonna put the short side just up over your head, just okay. like it's draped over, like you're a little okay. kid trying to hide under the covers. Okay, like that? Yep, we don't even need to go that much over your head, just a little bit okay. right there. Now in the front, because he doesn't have a blanket pin with him, what we're looking for is we're gonna use a thorn. And this thorn came off a locust tree. So we can take this in the front here and just pin that through. Now that's not gonna hold as well as a blanket pin, but it's mm -hmm. still gonna work really good. You can then pull this back down, and now you also have a hood. Mm -hmm. Now all of this down here can get a little bit messy, so we can okay. take just a very basic buckskin right. and tie this around us, just like that. And now we can have our right. hands out if needed. Yep. We can close in, and you can pull up your hood. So we've got this this uh, one piece of garment, or this one you know blanket, during the day, it's cold out, we can wear this like a coat, and then later on in the night, all we have to do is take it off and it's blanket. 
Yep. It's so, so versatile. I, I love this. Okay, so you're out in the woods. You got all this equipment. You got blankets and everything else. How do you carry all this stuff? Still have your hands free to do what you need to do. So traditionally, a tump line was used many times, and this is a hand-woven tump line that I made. Thicker section throughout the middle that's okay. actually going to be against us, and then two longer ends on each end and then they're also split out it just gives it a lot more versatility total so like, length of this is about 20 foot so, so yeah, it's, it's really like a huge long strap okay. you can use it for not only carrying your blankets but firewood you can use it if you need to lash things up in the trees all that we want to do is make sure this wide spot this wide part of the strap is in front of the blanket and then right. we take the two sides and cross over the blanket itself and then we're going to roll the blanket around these two thinner straps. This is about the trickiest part. And the reason I say that is because we have to roll this and keep this out of the blanket. We're not ah, gonna roll yes. that in. Okay. And now we can bring those straps into the center and begin to tie this off. There's no real particular way to yeah. specifically tie this off, but as long as you have this tied off so it holds your blanket in place, We can then take our tump line and throw it up over our shoulders and place it across our chest this way, or we can also place it across the front of our head and use our body weight to help hold that in place. The beauty of it though is it keeps our hands free, so we can hold yeah. our flintlock, we can still hunt, we can do work, and it's very easy to travel like this. Mm -hmm. Sounds perfect. Tell me about cordage and what you're going to use it for. So cordage is very valuable anytime you're around camp. Everything from making bundles of gear to shelter setups to different cook systems. Mm -hmm. So if we don't bring cordage with us or we only have a minimal amount of cordage, how are we going to use the resources around us to make cordage? The cordage you have there is made from inner bark of tulip poplar tree. It's a very good strong cordage. So we can take a look at actually how you process that and then make the cordage. Let's go find some tulip bark to make into cordage. So right here we have some tulip poplar. There's actually a small patch of it. If you look to identify tulip poplar tree, do you see how it looks almost like a cantaloupe and it has these chevron shapes up it? And what this actually is, is as the tree's growing, it wants to get up above the rest of the trees around it. So it's dropping its branches off. So that's an easy way to identify. But we have this piece here that's already starting to die off and is gonna fall over anyway. So we can very easily collect this bark in this situation. All that we need to do is just pull it right off the tree. See how these long strips come off. Right. So we can take this back to camp and process this down. And once we have this process down, we can use this cordage for anything from hanging kettles to lashing tripods to making other cook systems, even tying up any type of bundles of gear that we have. Mm -hmm. So it's just a good multi-purpose item to be able to make for things that we don't have out here. So we want the inner part of the bark, not the outer part the of the bark, correct? The inner part, correct. So once you start to work with this a little bit, right. you'll see that that outer bark starts to fall right off. Right. So that outer bark is no good, just that inner bark is all that we're looking for. What, what other kinds of trees can we use? Basswood is another good mm -hmm. choice. So anything that has long fibrous inner bark is gonna work okay. really, really well. And um, this has, this is dyed off. Is green gonna work? Green just will, as well. Yes, green will work just as well. If it's very dry, it doesn't break down as easily to be mm -hmm. able to get these long strands. So you actually want to re-wet that and it gives it some more moisture in it and then you right. can work with it a little bit more. So I imagine the green might be a little tougher to peel than something like this that's already you know, Yes, if you can tree. find this, it's just saving energy and saving resources and we just go ahead with the okay. stuff that's well, already dying let's off. Let's take this back to camp and work it up. Okay. So how do we turn this uh, strip bark into cordage? Well, it's a very simple process. We can take this inner bark and you see it's already breaking down in numerous strands. Right. So we just pull these strands apart. I can hand you some and I'll okay. keep some myself. Now, initially we want to start to twist this, but we don't want to twist it dead center. We want to offset it. And that okay. comes into play a little bit later on. So like so, one third of the way in? Yeah, just one third mm -hmm. away and just start to twist it over. Any, am I twisting any, toward the long end or the short end? Any way you oh, want because okay, okay. we're going to be using both. So okay. you just start twisting and you're going to twist this until the cordage itself, the future cordage, starts to turn on itself. Now 
To make this two-ply reverse wrap cordage, we want to turn one of these strands okay. in one single direction. So in my case, being right-handed, I'm turning this inward. Yeah, my natural inclination is to go the opposite direction. Yes. So, okay. So once you get them twisted and they look round uh -huh. like this, at that point then you're going to rotate both of them the opposite direction. So I was twisting to the left, we're going to twist both of them to the right. So is it kind of good that our bark has already sort of broken down because it's a, per a certain age, it's been sitting on the forest floor and it's wet? Is that help? Wet's really going to help because that's yeah. going to give it more pliability. Mm -hmm. If it was really dry, you would want to wet it anyway. So you right. would get a pot of water and just dip it in and let it get some moisture right. in it. And that's going to allow us to twist this down to nice cordage. Mm -hmm. So we need to splice in more pieces. And this is always going to happen throughout your entire cordage making process because we can't get an infinity piece of inner bark. So we could try. At some point, we're, <laughs> we're going to run short. So what we want to do is take the shorter end of the two and that's right. why we offset that so, at the beginning right because now we have a shorter end to splice so if it is twisted we want to untwist it and make it nice and flat and lay our second new piece right up against it right okay. up against that just like this and now we're going to continue our same process so i'm going to continue twisting and spinning so those two are just going to get twisted they're going up to get, together, and yep. then they're going to get twisted together with the other side, and that will splice that up Splice it in. Okay. Once you get going with it, your muscle memory really kicks in, and you just get a good rhythm with it, and then you're just grabbing your new piece, adding it in, and mm -hmm. going along with it. Now, to vary your your thickness of your cordage that you're making, you just vary the thickness of the material you're using. So okay. if you need a thicker piece or a thinner piece, depending on whatever project you're making it for, mm -hmm. would depend on how much of the inner bark you actually gather. So have you ever tried doing it with three ply or? Yeah, so there's different techniques you can use with three ply that are a little bit more advanced, but um, majority of time two ply is gonna be yeah. more than strong enough as you can tell right. for anything right. that we would need from tripod lashings to bundling up any kind of animal pelts right. to tying out gear. Right, and this seems uh, real flexible, real pliable. It's not yeah. real stiff. How does What's this like when it dries out? So it does stiffen up when it dries out. It's not extremely hard to the point that you can't still put knots and things mm -hmm. such as that in it. So I always tell individuals, if you use it, let's say to set up a shelter and it starts to dry out, you can always pour a little bit of water over that. It will soften it back up and you can pull it back out. Right. right. So what, you got a uh, two or three foot long piece? Yes. And how much do you think it'll weight how much weight do you think it'll carry um i would say at least 30 40 pounds probably well we got a so, pot here that's maybe i don't know it's probably a little less than 20. okay so i think this will have no problem picking yeah. that up yeah no nope, no problem at all that's that's Easy. they're pretty amazing stuff yeah and if you think about it, if you're going to use something like that to support a water pot or you right. have to tie something off against a tree it's more than enough tensile strength to be and able if, to do that and if you really wanted to you could just bundle two pieces Double together like and that you and you've more. got twice as much yep. yeah the biggest thing you need to keep in mind is that your splices are going to be weak points so you want right. to make sure that you splice enough together not just a little bit that way it's giving it more strength through that right. splice right. so you probably want to get as long a strip as you can to be twisting up yep. anyway so you got fewer splices exactly right and if you had three ply you'd have you could spread that splice strength out over a longer yep. distance too yeah yep. amazing stuff so uh, what's our other option for a uh, simple cordage? So there would be a lot of access to hides out on the frontier. So if we think about any type of brain tan, mm -hmm. buckskin, we can use that by making a simple few cuts. So what I have here is a piece of brain tan buckskin. Mm -hmm. And this would be something common, not only used for leggings, but moccasins. So the men out there would have scraps of this at times that they sure. can also do other things with. And we're gonna talk about making cordage with this because it's a very viable option. If initially you think about just cutting a thin strip, that's good, but you can see with this scrap piece, we can yeah. only get short strips and we gotta worry about knotting it. So another technique that we can use is by setting it down on something and taking our knife and cutting a circle. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle, just something circular. Okay, so once we have our circle piece cut, we can set our scrap off to the side. And then all that we would need to do now is just begin to cut this in a spiral fashion. And that's mm -hmm. gonna give us a lot more length than just cutting it in single strips. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna just get in here and start with cutting a small strip open. And then it's gonna be easiest to hold this and then 
begin to cut around. Now, depending on how thick we want our cordage, depends on how thick we're gonna make this piece. So you could see how much cordage we actually yeah, got from that, that, was just that a, little circle. Yeah. So you really can make a lot. But go ahead and give that a really good pull and see if you yeah, can. So it's like I could. I mean, <laughs> I mean no, no, really I give it. I, yeah, I mean you can really okay, pull it. Okay, you can. But you can. Wow, I would but say. But I mean, there was a lot of strength in right, there. Right. What do you think? To be able to pull that. that and normally, uh, what happens with the brakes there mm -hmm. is because my knife might have went right. off a little bit or so something like that. Got a little thin. Whatever, right. So. Right. Yeah. But but it doesn't have I mean it doesn't really have too much of a grain to it or anything no. so that even when you cut in a circle it's still going to be really strong. Right. So right. even tying out something like leggings like you have yeah, yeah. some rope sure. there. Yeah. You can use it like that. You'll be able to use it to tie up your bedroll. You can use it to tie up your tarp. Anything like that would work. And I suppose if you needed more strength you could braid it together. Or you yeah. could do you could do a lot to get a really yep. heavy string. And this this is brain tan. You this could do it with um, rawhide. Yes. Or other other. Rawhide uh, was traditionally used for bow strings, uh -huh. so you would cut the same process, cut it the same way with the round circle, right? Spiral, and then you would stretch it out while it's wet and twist it, and that would give you and your that's bow string. Amazing strength there. Yes. I mean that's a lot of strength. We're going to be talking about woodland cooking systems. Explain. Yeah. So we're going to make a variety of different cooking systems. When you're around camp and you have just that campfire going, rather than sticking a piece of meat on a stick and struggling with it or burning it. I do that. It. That's yep. me. <laughs> so rather than doing that, you can make different cook systems with what's around us here in the environment to really make cooking more pleasurable, make your food better. Right. Not only make rotisseries, but we can make tripods so we can make better stews and really control what we're doing. Because we need to think about the long hunters out there. They had yeah. very limited meat at certain times. so they didn't have the option of burning the meat or absolutely dropping it and losing it in the fire. So they had to be a little bit more particular. So if you make a nice cook system, you can not only feed yourself better, but you do have multiple men. You could set up cook systems so everybody can do what they need to do around that campfire. So what do we need for getting this done? A variety of different branches out here. So we're gonna go pick some and then we'll okay. get started with the systems. So what kind of species and type of wood were we looking for here? So it depends on the cook system. Species doesn't matter too much as long as it's green wood. We don't want any type of dead wood for the simple fact that it's going to be exposed to heat at some point. So we don't want that actually catching on fire. So green wood's going to be best. For the tripod, which I really feel is a quintessential camp tool, mm -hmm. because not only can we cook with it, but we can use it for a smoke system to smoke meat, but we can also use it for shelters, smoking hides, it's very important. So with something like this, we want long straight sticks about an inch in diameter Okay, is good enough. That's going to be good and strong if it's green wood and about five to six foot in length is Perfect. most optimal. You can make them shorter, but this longer length just yeah. seems to be a Gives little bit more better. options. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So the process can be very simple or very complex. We're going to take the middle of the road. We're going to put a proper lashing on this. Okay. So if cordage was at a very minimum out in the field, you can just use one or two wraps and make it sort of work, but right. we'll put a good lashing on here. And then the way we're going to lash this, we can always remove that cording, that cordage when we're done. Okay. So it's a very right. simple thing. So we thing. can reuse it. Yeah. Yes. So first thing we want to do is get the bottom of our sticks lined up. And again, right. I cut all of these very close to the same length. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the sticks where they lay very Flat, evenly. Right. Yep. And I'll take a piece of cordage that I have. Now how you start this can vary. There's no really proper way. So I'm just going to put a loop on here that has a slip knot okay. and start to tighten this down. Now, anytime we wrap around the sticks this way is a lashing right. and the wrappings inside are the frappings. Okay. So first we're going to put a lashing. So we're going to begin to just wrap this around these sticks mm -hmm. and just take your time with this and get it to lay in there properly. So we looking to bind these up really tight. Well, you can, it depends on what project. If this was a shelter, I would really want to bind these up good and tight so right. it doesn't move. One option you could do to bind these up tight is take just an extra piece of stick that I gathered while right. I'm out there and use it as a toggle just to right. 
tighten that up. Now you see how that bunched up? We don't yeah. want that to happen. So we're gonna just open that back up a little bit and use our knee right here uh -huh. to keep that in line. And I'm just gonna tighten that down. So for every three lashings, one frapping is right. a good idea. Okay. So it doesn't have to be exact, but as long as we're close with that, I think it's gonna hold up just fine for us. So I'm done my lashings there. I will grab my toggle again, just to put a little bit of tension on that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna begin my frappings. So I'm gonna go in between right. each of this and around. And this is really what's gonna bind up mm -hmm. and make this work more properly. Now you might have to play around with this a little bit to get it to yeah, fit work. Between, yeah. Yep. And I'm just gonna continue, I'll put two frappings okay around in between uh, each one of those in right? between each one of those and really that'll be it then at this point so we made our, la our lashings and our frappings. Now to finish this off, mm -hmm. you could do several different things. We're just going to put a half hitch in here just to hold something it. Something simple, yeah. Just something simple to hold it in place and we will be set to go. So should we give yeah. this a try now over yeah, the fire? Yeah, we'll All right, so very simple, just open it up. And you can feel it's a little bit tight now, but yeah. that will adjust over time right. as we loosen up on that. And this is our leftover? Now, yeah, so we always want to make sure that we have leftover cordage because mm -hmm. it's very simple. Then we take that toggle I was using to tighten down that right. lashing. And with just a very simple slip knot, okay. so I place that simple toggle on if you'd like to grab that pot. pot. Yeah. And then we just use that bail to hold our pot in place. Look at that. Now the beauty of this system is number one, we can make very fine adjustments by just sliding our tripod in. You see we've got right. some height. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to grab that leg and open that up. Right we sure. can even get lower. Mm -hmm. And then if we need other type of adjustment, we can also always wrap this over the top. Sure. And we can really get that high off of the fire. And that way, if we need to simmer something, it works really well. So you can see how well yeah. this works with something. Yeah, it's so simple and Very simple. so versatile. Yep. Yep. So what have we got here? So we're gonna make a pot suspension system. And the beauty of this system is that you can put multiple pots on the campfire, you can make it as big as you would need. So if you have a right. real big long fire and multiple men at camp, everybody can use the fire equally. Uh -huh. So what we're gonna need to do is we need two uprights that are Y branches. Okay. Now these can vary in length. I like to say around three foot in length is best okay. with a Y on top. And then on the outside of your fire pit, you're gonna just push them straight down inside. So if you wanna right. give a little push down to that one, get them as level as we can. And then what we're gonna do is just take a straight branch that's long enough to go across both of them, okay. just like that. And you can level this system out as much as you would need to, right. but it looks pretty good right now. So you might be thinking, what actually are we gonna do yeah. with this? I mean, we just have a bar hanging there. Well, we make hang hangers. So there's different types of hangers we can make. This hanger right here is just a Y branch. So it was growing up this way. We trimmed it here and I put a notch up top. Right. But we're actually gonna flip that to use it. So when we hang our pot, we use that notch and mm -hmm. we can hang it this way over the fire. You could put multiple notches up on here and that will allow the pot different heights depending what you need. Sure. Then we can also take two Y branches if we have some extra twine or cordage with us mm -hmm. and tie them off. So I have one Y branch that was growing this way and another one that was growing this way, lashed them together, hang right. that on here. Right. And, so and we then can... you can hang your pot on there. Right. Also. So as you can see, we're a little close to the fire there, so making multiple hangers is gonna be most beneficial. And again, you could take this up as high as you'd want or as low as you want, depending right. on what you're actually doing. And we could hang other things on this other than the pots. We could probably, you could even hang a piece of meat on that if you needed yep, to. Yep, or, or if whatever. you took sliced meat and you skewered it through, you can right. hang it almost like a kebab and then just cut it as it cooks. Right. So what do we got here? Well, this is very similar, the setup to the last pot suspension system. So we still have the Y upright branches, but you right. can see that I lowered them a lot. Okay. And the reason I lowered them is we're actually gonna make a rotisserie. So if we have any type of meat source, we can actually rotisserie it over the fire. Now to do that, rather than just that single straight stick, yeah. I took another Y branch and then okay. I lashed a smaller branch onto that. And the reason okay. for that is if we put just a piece of meat on a round branch, it's gonna spin and we can't get that rotisserie effect. So this is gonna right. work as a clamp. Once we skewer our meat and tie it down, 
then the meat's not gonna go anywhere. We can lay this across the Y yep. branch just like this. And the reason this is a Y is because we can then use that to- Incrementally rotate it. Yes. Yeah. Yep, so we're gonna do that and we can just turn it around that way. Now, this morning I actually harvested a rabbit so we can put the rabbit right on the skewer and take a look at what it looks like. Okay. So I now have this lashed on and you can see as I rotate this, it's not sliding on the spit itself. Right. So we can set it right in place here like this. And then as we need to rotate that, we would just do so. So it works really well this way to just constantly keep rotating that and get a good, nice, even roast all around it. Well, we've got meat, we got the, the, the uh, cooking system. I suppose we should get a fire going and uh, cook this rabbit up. This reminds me so much of what's going on in Nicholas Cresswell's journal. They're traveling into the backcountry. They don't have very many provisions and many of the provisions they have with them get spoiled along the way. Um, they are eating off the land as they travel. You know, whatever game they can get a hold of, that's what they're cooking. They're eating in the most simplistic way possible. So the rabbit has been cooking now for about 25 to 30 minutes. And in the spirit of the long term, we're just gonna eat right off the stick here. So we'll cut ourselves a little section. I'm gonna cut some of this back strap off for us right through here. Get you some meat right off that. Hey, it looks done. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give it a little taste here. Smoked rabbit. Yeah, rotisserie style. Yeah. Really good. And if you were hungry and didn't eat for a couple days, it'd be really good. Yeah. And no gaminess at all on this thing. Nope. It's wonderful, um, basically chicken flavor, really. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about, well, a lot about Nicholas Cresswell's journal. Nicholas Cresswell was a young Englishman. He was touring North America looking about what his future life was going to be like. He's wondered if this was where he wanted to settle. And he, he had some adventures in the back country. And let me read this particular journal entry, and we're going to try to reproduce this. Uh, this is May 18th, 1775, and he's probably in what is now Kentucky. He says, all hands are employed in curing our buffalo meat, which is done in a peculiar manner. The meat is first cut from the bone in thin slices like beef steaks, then four sticks are stuck in the ground in a square form. Small sticks are laid on these forks to form a gridiron about three feet off the ground. The meat is laid on this and a slow fire put under it and it is turned until it is done. And then he says, this is called jerking the meat. That's what they referred to it during the time. Um, it answers very well, well where salt is not to be had and will keep a long time if it is secured from the wet. So does this sound like a typical you know, like cooking method you would do. Yeah, so anytime you're gonna preserve meat, smoking's a great resource to do that, and you can use just about everything in the environment to help us get right. that and going. Right, he, and he describes a, a, exactly a, what a method just like we've kind of done a little bit earlier. So we're gonna reproduce that. What do we need for this? So we're gonna get the four sticks that have Ys on the top, so uh -huh. four sticks, and then we'll get a bunch of straight sticks that are going to create that grill top in a sense. Right. And then once we lay that over, we're gonna take it one step further though, we'll put a tripod over it and then wrap it with some extra material that we have here. And that's gonna help trap the smoke in and allow it to cure a little bit quicker. So I got our buffalo meat that we uh, cut up earlier. If you're gonna do try this at home, make sure to try to get this cut uh, across the grain as much as possible. Uh, this is regular buffalo and we're just gonna lay it out on our, our gridiron here. Have a, there you go, have a piece here. Some of these pieces aren't beautiful, but uh, you know, sometimes the buffalo fights you, so. Now we're smoking the meat, so we have the meat set on our rack that we built. What we're gonna do is take just an old scrap of cotton canvas, and we're gonna wrap it around this tripod. It's gonna help block that smoke. Right now we don't have a lot of smoke, but we have a good bed of embers, so we can feed that with dry wood. We don't want a lot of flame and heat, so we'll feed that with not only dry wood, but then green wood, because that green wood's gonna give a nice smoke, and we really want this to get super smoky in here and dry this meat out. So we'll just take this old canvas and wrap it carefully around this tripod to start to trap in all that smoke. When you're doing this, you always also wanna be careful that none of this is down too low, that it's gonna actually catch fire. 
so we can just fold that up the best we can. And that's gonna help trap a lot of that smoke inside to okay. dry out that meat. So let's get that fire stoked up and we'll be good to go. A lot of the skills that I have learned were passed on from many different individuals over the years. If it was not people who directly spoke with me, it's from their writings and teachings that they have written in books and journals. I would like to pass a lot of this information on to my son so he has a better understanding of what it took for individuals to come to this new land and prosper and make lives for them and their own families. Here is our dried buffalo meat, kind of smoked and dried. And this is what they would have been doing on the, on the trail uh, to preserve their buffalo. And, you know, Crestwall talks about this completely, gives us this whole process. So we tried this out. It took longer than I expected. Uh, you know, we, we dried it for several hours and then we kind of basically had to let it go all night long before it really got nice and dry. And really what we're looking for is drying it, not cooking it, and you can see by these finished pieces, they're kind of black and they kind of crack open. They're, they're not real soft. If they're soft, they're gonna rot. And he talks about how if you keep them dry, they're gonna last a long time. Now, maybe for a long time for him was, you know, a couple of weeks or a month. But now the question is, what do we do with these? Now we can try eating these just like they are. Here you go, Dan, you, you give one, okay. get a try, pick one out there. Um, in, it, in this state, you know, it's tough, it's dry. It's meat. Yeah, it's if meat. If you're hungry, it'd be great. Right. It's good. Definitely, I mean, with the buffalo meat, you got a little different flavor yep. than, than beef. Nicely smoked, though. Really got good a little, smoke flavor. A nice little smoke flavor to it. They wouldn't necessarily just eat it like this. So they might use this, reconstitute it in a stew, you know, put it in the, in the boiling water, kind of let it you know, uh, uh, kind of reconstitute itself, expand a little bit. It's gonna probably make a really, really interesting stew. Mix it with some of your other ingredients because you don't wanna just be eating this on the trail all the time. You wanna mix it up, right? Yep, and I think too, we need to realize that they were eating to survive. Yeah. So many times now we think about eating for pleasure where they were eating because they needed to eat to live. So something like this is a pure survival food. A lot of protein, a little bit of fat in there. It's yeah. great to get you through and get you to the next meal. Yeah, it gives you time. energy mm -hmm. and all that. Really, the kind of more fat, the better, really, in this yeah. kind of circumstance. Um, he, he even, you know, Cresswell talks about, he complains that these guys don't want to stick around to take the time to make these provisions, to dry this stuff out. But uh, if you have this dried, ready to go, when you're, you know, headed out to your uh, event, you can have this. Perfect. Uh, if you're doing something like Long Hunter, where they would have had this sort of provision with them. So what would you need? A little bit of this? A little bit of flour or cornmeal, and I think you really have a, yeah. a full setup of being right. able to go out and then hunt for the rest of your food, fish, and then have this as a backup. We're gonna be cooking a venison heart. Why are we using venison? Why are we using a heart? So venison would have been something that the frontiersmen would have been able to hunt, and we're using heart meat because while at camp, if we ran out of the good meat that we wanted, maybe the back straps and hindquarters, if we ate all of that and the weather became inclement or we were locked into a location that we couldn't move from and game just wasn't available for us to hunt at that time or we had no luck while we were out there, we're still gonna wanna eat. So those organs are still a viable option and it's food until we can get something a little bit better. Right. There's some great stories in Nicholas Cresswell, some really interesting parts where they're hunting buffalo. They'll kill a buffalo and then a day later, two days later, they're out of food again. They're moving, they're eating the best parts of the animal, and then they're probably leaving all the rest behind. But then later on, they're starving, and boy, they'll eat anything they can get, even if it's a deer heart. So that's what we're gonna be cooking up today. We're using some of the, of the simplest utensils today, along with simple provisions that we would have along with us. Obviously, we've got the deer heart, We've got a little bit of uh, fat here. It's actually a little bit of suet from the animal. And um, the other uh, common ration or, or uh, provision that we would have along with us is cornmeal. So we got a little bit of cornmeal. That's about it. All we need is a frying pan, just a few little utensils. So let's get this cooking up. We've got some slices of heart here. 
uh, nice and thin. This can cook up tough, so we want to make sure to, to uh, slice it nice and thin. And we're just going to bread it in a little bit of cornmeal. Pop it in the frying pan. I've already got the suet going. So heart does show up in regular 18th century cooking, but not quite like this. This is so simple. Um, in 18th century recipe books, generally heart shows up. They talk about cooking the pluck of an animal. And the pluck is things like uh, the heart, the lungs, and some other components. You might have chitterlings, other parts of the offal of an animal, but they, they called it the pluck, which I think is a nice term for it. Mm -hmm. um, and they would use those in things like haggises and other cooking methods like that, where you would sort of hash it up and um, boil it in an animal's stomach or even in a pudding bag. So there are several different recipes that use pluck but it doesn't show up a lot in that regular kind of fancy cooking in the cookbooks. Well, our, uh, our heart is off the fire. It looks like it's cooked through. It doesn't take very long with nice thin strips like that. Um, so what do you think? Is this ready? I think it looks good, but I think a little bit of nutmeg would set this off. Uh, you know, I just happen to have my, uh, my, uh, Little pocket spice kit here. It's basically full of nutmeg. There's a little bit of salt and pepper in there too, but we can try just a little bit of nutmeg to just set these off. There you go. I can't wait to try this. I'm worried that's gonna be way too tough. We're gonna find out. Hey, I can taste that nutmeg. Mm-hmm. It's actually really good. It's not too tough. No, it's not, not tough at all. At all. <clears throat> The cornmeal and suet, I think, also give it a good taste. It yeah. just Rather than just grilled meat. It tastes a little bit more different than grilled meat. So. Right. Now, you could take these and, you know, kind of brown them up. You could put, put these in a stew, mm -hmm. you know, in this circumstance. In fact, Nicholas Cresswell talks about times when he's got just a little bit of flour and he doesn't want to waste them making bread. He wants to use them in a soup to kind of thicken it up. He would do the same thing slice up the meat small, cook it a little bit, toss it in there, make a stew with water, a little bit of flour, kind of thicken it up. This, hey, it turned out really good for such a simple, quick way of cooking. Almost no ingredients whatsoever. We just need a little bit of frying pan, a couple little eating utensils that we would have yes. with us anyway as, as tools when we're out here in the woods. So, wow, you, if you get a chance, try something simple like this. You're out in the backwoods, and one of the things that we've got that you would think that you would get rid of, you'd throw it out, would be the fat off the inside of a hide, right? Yes, exactly. So we have a raccoon hide actually here, and during the long hunter era, they would bring a lot of hides back. We know that they would yep. go out and trap and bring hides back. And to process a hide correctly, once you have it skinned out and you have the carcass outside the animal, we need to remove this heavy fat layer that's right. inside, and that's gonna keep the skin from actually rotting. So we need to remove that. But when we remove that fat, we can utilize that around camp to not only protect our equipment, but also protect some of the gear that we wear, such as moccasins and leggings. So the main thing they were doing out here was hunting. And one of the things they were doing is bringing back hides. And every single one of those hides would have to be processed right yep. there in the field, right? Yep, right at their camp, they would have to right. process So everything. all that, every single one of these hides would have to be scraped and so that's that's what you're going to do with this one today yep and then we're going to take it one step further and we're going to make something called fat wax and that fat wax is that protectant i was talking about right here we have our raccoon hide and what we need to do now is take this heavy layer of fat off so it's turned inside out the hair side is in and ideally to preserve this hide to be able to do anything else with it we need to get this fat off and we're going to take this fat off just quickly what we're using here is a deer scapula because this is something again that's outside it's one less piece of gear that we would have to carry around camp mm -hmm. So all we're going to do is begin to scrape this fat and it comes off quite easy as you can see. Yeah. So as I get that off, what I'm going to do then with it is take some of this, see it almost pulls off right. and I'm going to just drop it into my pot and we're going to render that down. So I'm going to continue this process to try to gather as much of this fat off. Ideally to preserve the hide, we want to get all the fat off. So this is raccoon. Um, the other obvious animals are deer. What, what other kind of animals would they also do this with? Bear has a lot of good fat, so they call bear grease. You can mm -hmm. make 
same idea with it. So the bear, beaver also has a lot of fat on it, would work really well. Something like a fox or a coyote or even a possum, they just don't have enough fat to really render it out to uh -huh. do anything like this. So how long do you think this is going to take to render down? The amount of fat we have in there will probably take anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. So you just want to just slowly cook this, allow that fat to have rendered down, so basically melt and liquefy. And I keep stirring it around. We don't want it to burn or anything right. like that. So we want to just take our time. There is some hair and there's some grizzle in there, yeah. which isn't a big problem because we're not using this to eat. We're using this to treat tools in the field. Right. And we'll know it's done when we've got mostly liquid and then whatever kind of uh, connective tissue kind of gets scraped off to the side. The yes. cracklings. The cracklings. Right? Yep. Right. The hardener that we need for this is some melted beeswax. So this looks like it's cooked down really well. Is it ready to go? Yeah, at this point it's ready to go. What we're looking for is 50% tallow, 50% wax. So we got beeswax here and it's pretty much melted. Okay, so we can take our tallow right off of our okay. fire. And I'm gonna mix these two together. Try to keep as much of the solids out, solids yeah. out as possible. Give this a little mix. And then we're gonna take this and we'll put this in a smaller tin. That way it's more portable. Yeah, we can store it right in here. Yep. Now that we have the wax and the tallow mixed, we can just let it sit and cool. And once it's cooled down, then we can apply it to whatever we would need. The fat wax is now hardened up, so you can use this on a multitude of different things. We can use it on any type of metal, so we can take something like my tomahawk here, and we could just work that onto the metal, and that's going to give it a good protectant so it doesn't rust in foul weather like this. It also works really well on a wood handle. It's going to help protect that wood to not let it dry out and crack, anything like that. It works very well for knife sheaths, anything that's leather works good for something even like my leggings if i want to add some water protectant to it i can do that flintlock rifle this works really well for also so there's just a huge variety of uses and in worst case scenario if you're out in the back country and you have very bad chap lips or anything like that you can also use it as a lip balm itself so you right. can put it on so there and it moisturizes yep kind of protectant and lubricant for uh, whatever you need yep sounds great so it's amazing what you can do with a little bit of beeswax and the fat left over on the inside of a raccoon skin. Uh, I am amazed and it was really actually a very simple process, although mm -hmm. scraping the fat off didn't look that easy. I mean, that's pretty yeah, tough. Yeah, it's a little bit of a learned skill. So once you learn that skill, it's, it becomes right. pretty easy. And probably is harder and, and easier with different kinds of animal hides. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, uh, but still an amazing process and what you get left over, I mean, this, this finished product seems to be useful for just about everything. I mean, waterproof your clothing, waterproof your shoes, uh, you know, protect your, your uh, metal equipment. So uh, a tremendous quantity of uses that you can use it for. So uh, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted. It's just great to watch the process and a lot of fun. So thank you, Dan, thank for you, uh, bringing this uh, wonderful, sharing with us these skills and techniques it's, uh, it's uh, been so much fun working with Dan. If you're interested in uh, bushcraft, if you're interested in learning about how to survive in the wilderness, make sure to check out Dan's YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll put a link down in the des description below and also the uh, Coal Cracker Bushcraft the School. So make sure to check out that. That'll be down in the link also down in the description section. So thank you so much and thank you guys for watching. <music>